All right, the last uh, paper for this session is uh, Dr. Ron Johnson. His topic is Improving N.T. Wright's Grand Story. Is Genesis 3 the problem or Genesis 4, 3, 11? I'm going to leave some time at the end for questions, so I'm going to concentrate on pages 1 through 6 and then summarize 7 to the end of the paper. Okay. A decade ago, I was introduced to Paul in fresh perspective by a friend at church. The paper, is there any more? If, if you don't have it, it's right back there. This new book was to be the next subject of our Saturday men's Bible study. I had never read N.T. Wright before, and I do not recall what I was expecting to hear as I turned those first pages. I, it, but it did not take long to catch Wright's main point that the Bible had basically mis, that, that the church had basically misread Paul since the Reformation, and spirited discussion reshaped our formerly placid Bible study. I got to put these on. I can't see a thing. I'm sorry. Some men stopped coming altogether. We realized that a choice was being laid before us to either continue reading the Bible as we knew it or to start over with another competing story of Scripture. We could just not add Wright's thoughts to those we had already in place as traditional evangelical Christians. Ten years later, and with most of Wright's books read, marked, and waiting on my shelf to be reread, I have come to believe that Wright is basically right. He is telling the story that the Bible tells, and it is not the story I grew up with or learned in seminary. He defines a gospel that is attractive to me because, as best I can tell, he is accurately describing what it meant and what it means for Jesus to be Lord. Skip to the next paragraph. This paper essentially begins where Wright ends, with his large story of scripture intact. My appeal is to supply richer meaning to what he is already proposing. This paper is divided into three sections. First, I will briefly consider the story of the Bible as described by popular evangelicalism. Secondly, I will present a brief overview of N.T. Wright's story of the Bible as found in many of his current writings and lectures. In doing this, it will become very clear why Wright is being accused of tipping over our evangelical tables. Lastly, presented as the bulk of the study and the part that I'm just going to overview, I will recommend a biblical storyline which builds upon Wright by adding in specific elements of characterization, plot, and climax. Does evangelicalism have a story? Our Western biblical tradition does not have a reputation for emphasizing the larger story of Scripture. Asking an evangelical Christian what the Bible is basically about will often bring a shortened, Wright would say flattened, storyline, possibly jumping from Genesis 3 to Matthew 26 in one motion. Most Christians think of Think of it this way. Biblical stories falling in between the fall of man and Christ's atonement are important while not being vital. The smaller stories did not need to happen in order for the largest story of all to come true. And lest we say that this view is limited to popular Christianity, observe where the word necessary falls in a recent evangelical book written for the sole purpose of understanding the general flow of the biblical story. And this is his summary um, at the end of the book about the whole book. Okay. God created a kingdom and he is king, and he made human but he made human beings to represent him in that kingdom. Adam and Eve rejected this call, which led to sin and death. But God promised to defeat the serpent through the seed of the woman, who was also the seed of Abraham. Through Abraham's family, and specifically Judah's royal seed, David, the covenant blessings would come to the world. Because all people were guilty and deserved death, the sacrifices of the Mosaic law revealed more clearly their need for a substitute, the suffering servant. Through the servants and the work of the Spirit, God would establish a new covenant and give lasting life to his people in the new heavens and the new earth. Jesus is the one through whom all these promises find fulfillment, first in his sacrificial death as a necessary and just payment for sin, and then in his victorious resurrection and reign as king. This great story will find its culmination when the redeemed from every tribe, tongue, and nation gather in the new creation to live with God forever. It is certainly fair to ask whether Bruno is telling the evangelical story. Along with our ancient Jewish forefathers, modern evangelicals take a certain amount of well-placed pride in disagreeing among themselves about the meaning of texts and entire stories. That's ETS, right? That being said, I propose that Bruno has adequately summarized the biblical story as told by popular evangelicalism. I would chart the story this way, and I'll explain the chart with those five points below. The first level story, which is the largest arc there, is creation to recreation often functioning out of sight as a worldview. So as it happens, that's the first and last sentence of Bruno's quote, if you look at it. The second level story, the smaller arc, is Adamic guilt to human justification. That's the second and second to last sentence in his quote, if you look at it, answering the question of how can a man be right with God. 
Number three, the atonement of Christ is the necessary event supporting the fulfillment of the second level story. That's Jesus there in the picture. Number four, third level stories and fourth level. Move the second level story along by generally functioning as illustration, example, prophecy, and so forth. David and Goliath, the temptation of Christ. Um, the Jerusalem Council. Think of your stories and how they move the story. Usually we put them as examples, illustrations, and types, things like that. Number five, the summons of the gospel message. What to do in order to get it, or to get saved, as we would say, is passive acceptance of the atonement provided in Christ's death. It's given to you. It's imputed to you. It's meant to be a, uh, accepted as a gift. My principal concern here has to do with point number four. Between the main problem, the fall, and the main solution, the atonement, no intervening smaller story functions to necessarily connect these two ideas together. We could have literally jumped from Genesis to Matthew as pilgrims with suspiciously clean feet, as N.T. Wright has been heard to complain. When Bruno offers a theological connection at one point, for example, the sacrifices of the Mosaic Law revealed more clearly their need for a substitute, he is not talking story, but paradigm. No story catches someone saying, I realize I need a substitute when offering a sacrifice. In my opinion, it is, it is our over-acquaintance with this evangelical model, which has led to a general lack of awareness to the jarring nation, nature of what this model recommends. Adam sinned. If you've ever, ever given the gospel to someone, and the, the Romans road, you know it, and you get to the fourth point, and they say, what does that have to do with the first three? Okay. Adam sinned, Jesus atoned, and these two ends of the story find no necessary connection to the Jerusalem Council. Think of your third, fourth level stories. This should at least make us suspicious. I'll skip this paragraph, but my point is it's odd that, well, not odd to me, but to my background, that Adam is never blamed for the problem. You, you leave Genesis 3 and Adam's story is just never picked up, as though they didn't think it was the problem. Page 3. What is N.T. Wright's story? The greatest value of N.T. Wright in my personal study has been his love of and commitment to the biblical story. We may disagree here or there with details within his story, and this is to be expected. He has been a gracious conversation partner for evangelicals, inviting constant revisions of his own views. He dedicates his books to his long-standing critics. What we cannot walk away from, however, and what we cannot afford to be unmoved by is Wright's belief that there is ultimate value and beauty in the larger story of Scripture. Few sitting Christians are desperately wanting to hear a story like Wright's, and it has little to do with whether he is right or wrong. They simply want to know what's going on when they open the Bible. A summary of Wright's view of the large story is tucked into the depths of that Paul book that he just wrote. To make Here it is. To make life as easy as things get more complex, I shall now do what good storytellers never would do and reveal in advance the shape of what is to come in the next thousand pages. The first subplot of scripture, I suggest, is the story of the human creatures through whom the Creator intended to bring back or bring order to his world. Their failure and the cre Creator's determination to put that failure right and so get the original plan back on track demands a second subplot, which is the story of Israel as the people called to be the light of the world. This is the level of plot at which the Mosaic Law plays out its various roles, like the complex but integrative roles given to the moon in a Midsummer Night's Dream. Then, because of Israel's own failure, we find the third and final subplot, which is the story of Jesus, Israel's crucified and risen Messiah. His work at the center of Paul's narrative world resolves the other subplots and gives a glimpse of the resolution to the main plot itself, the Creator's purpose for the whole cosmos. We can skip to page 4. And again, I'll chart Wright's story with five points. Number one, it's the same as evangelicalism traditionally, so I'll leave it alone. It's the largest art, creation and recreation. Number two, the second level story is human failure to corporate redemption. Instead of Adamic guilt to human salvation, he goes um, human failure to the larger idea of corporate redemption, answering the question, how can Abraham's blessings be realized? Number three, the faithfulness of Christ, not the atonement, is the necessary action, not the event, supporting the fulfillment of the second level story. By now, usually people are totally lost with N.T. Wright. Have you ever noticed? What do you mean? 
I'm long. Because they're so used to the first story, you have to tell them, put that story away. Gently, lovingly. But you got to put it away to understand right because he's not talking the same story. They, and that's where they usually get confused. Number five, third level stories and fourth, move the second level story forward, not just along, but forward by offering necessary detail with sometimes surprising twists and turns. So you can't skip the Jerusalem Council in N.T. Wright's view. It is part of the story. It is necessary to the gospel, he would say. It's not an example of something. Number five, the summons of the gospel message is active participation. You don't get something from God. You actively put the yoke of the kingdom on and off you go. And that is, I was going to say, that's it. And you can hear the evangelicals wail away at how that doesn't fit their model. Wright has admitted that his story, like that of the traditional evangelicalism, is based upon something more than a bare text. He also joins evangelicals in seeing the largest first-level story of Scripture involving God's constant move toward restoring created order. He next agrees that placing human sin at the beginning of the second-level story best explains why, he, why the world took its abrupt turn toward sin and death as we now experience it. He differs from evangelicals, and here we go, however, in what he does not say. The idea of Adam's guilt being passed along to humanity never seems to gain footing in any of Wright's books or lectures. This omission seems intentional. If he were to respond directly to the charge of somehow missing Adam's guilt as the problem of mankind, I believe Wright would say, this is not an omission of my own. I merely find that Adamic guilt was simply not part of the story that the Old Testament nor first century Jews were telling. Most evangelical criticism of Wright, however, is reserved for his take on Christ's role in solving the human dilemma or the resolution of the second-level story. Those who read Wright carefully notice he does not emphasize, though he doesn't deny, the concept of penal substitution. In his defense, Wright often presents the death of Jesus in a way that tries to keep room between a theology of the cross and a theology of atonement. His deafness in keeping these conversations distinct invites criticism from those who do fold the meanings of the cross and atonement into each other, or see them as accomplishing the same thing. Wright often ends up defining the meaning of the death of Christ in ways not used by, nor found usable by, evangelicals. In my hearing, many evangelicals are saying that a Messiah fulfilling Abraham's promises are fine, yes, even necessary, but this alone is not enough to solve the human dilemma. There also needs to be, so they say, some kind of grand exchange of righteousness in order for mankind to be justified or saved. And here comes dozens of books and articles and YouTubes decrying Wright's view of justification. How can a Messiah, in just being a Messiah, solve humanity's problem? I had a pastor tell me that. I would never use Messiah in church anymore. People don't understand it. Think of that. How far we've come in 2,000 years. An evangelical pastor saying, I won't even use the term. Makes me want to cry, literally. It is precisely on this point that our two large-scale stories clash. And clash they must, for they these are very two different stories that cannot be placed on top of each other. Can N.T. Wright's story be improved? Well, I will now attempt a third alternative. If you do not agree with Wright, you probably hope I'll return to a cleaned-up version of evangelicalism. Many are attempting this with good results. We have been forced to think and speak more carefully, clearly because of N.T. Wright. This, however, will not be my recommendation. For those who agree with Wright, the following pages may also present a, a challenge. What I am proposing amounts to a third option, a story which builds on Wright, but does have some very specific interpretations which he denies. My departure from Wright and traditional evangelicalism begins with a different second-level story. My first, fourth, and fifth points agree with N.T. Wright, so I won't, agree, I won't mention those here. But the second and third differ. The second-level story is delegated authority. And what I mean by that is delegated divine authority. Okay? To reclaimed divine authority. Answering the question, how can God reign in righteousness or with propriety or properly? How can God be said to reign? That's the question I believe is being asked in the Bible. If this is his world, Job, all the way to the end, why are things happening the way they are? To me, that's the question everyone is asking. And it's not human justification. How can I be right with God? I think they got that settled in Genesis 15. It's not, what was Wright's view? Uh, whatever it was. I think it's this. Why is the world the way it is? 
based upon God's claim to reigning. Number three, the supremacy of Christ is presented, in my view, as the necessary development. It actually develops over time in uh, both plot and narrative. The paragraph below. As Wright did for us above, it is now my opportunity to give an advanced description of the shape of what is to come. The first level story of Scripture is ultimate recreation. The individual stories of the Bible all work toward the goal of a new heavens and earth in which righteousness dwells. The second level story takes its opening cue from the Garden of Eden in which the first human pair listened to the voice of a created deity and became, in Yahweh's words, like one of us. My interpretation of the crisis moment of Genesis 3 is therefore identified not as Adam's momentary disobedience to Yahweh, but as, as his active obedience to another deity. The story says that Adam awoke to something he should not have known, something he should not have experienced. The subsequent stories of Genesis 4 through 11 detail progressive crisis moments which build upon the theme of mankind's later service to and worship of created spirits. It is during these chapters, probably locatable alongside the Tower of Babel incident, that Yahweh delegates earthly authority to a host of created spirits. These gods will later be the primary subject of the first and second commandments. The call of Abraham to leave Babylon and relocate in Canaan is Yahweh's opening project on his way to reclaim the delegated authority he has given to created deities. Abraham's family descends into active idolatry, however, leading to exile. There, a remnant of faithful Jews ponder Yahweh's next move while suffering under Gentile oppression. Jesus' arrival on earth signals Yahweh's move to regain authority over creation, a physical return by God to the reign in Zion. Jesus defeats Satan, initially in the wilderness, and finally in his death, resurrection, and ascension to the Lord to be the Lord of over all the earth. During Jesus' life, stories are told of demonic obedience to his authority and Gentiles coming to recognize him as the true Lord of the cosmos. This demonic dread and Gentile belief frame the larger narrative of what Paul's the great mystery of godliness. The summons of the gospel includes, and I believe right on this, an invitation open to all mankind to participate in God's ultimate reign by placing one's loyalty upon Jesus as Lord through the power of the Spirit. The remainder of the paper um, is important because it's those third and fourth level stories that I believe push this second level story through. So by passing quick, you know, quickly through it, I don't mean to minimize, I hope, the value of it, but for time I will. The story of Genesis 3, third paragraph. The story which immediately follows Adam's departure from the garden hints toward a much more serious problem than the previous two paragraphs. We are told that Yahweh worship was absent from the time of Abel's death until the birth of Adam's grandson Enosh. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. It was then that men began to call upon the name of Yahweh. Before Enosh, the text seems to imply, or intend to say, people did not worship Yahweh. So a problem more critical than being dismissed from the Garden of Eden deserves our attention. Listening to one serpent has now given way to listening to the voices of other gods as well, and the situation has spread far beyond the Garden. But who are these other gods who will someday be the subject of the first commandment? Before the events of Genesis 3, we are never told when or why. A host of spirits was created by Yahweh. There were many, are many, unanswered questions regarding the origin of spirits or gods or deities. Tradition and poetry and myth are, have tended to confuse our understanding of what a, and I was going to say an Elohim, but a God, of course, is the same idea, even is. What is a God? That's a tough discussion. And it is by this means that many evangelical commentators have come to believe that the gods are fictitious. For his part, N.T. Wright is clear in his disbelief in the gods of the Old Testament, which necessarily colors his larger theological story. We can go to the next page. But in short, N.T. Wright believes that because the Olympic gods of Paul's day were myth, and Paul knew that, therefore the Old Testament gods are myth as well. Because Thor doesn't exist, neither does Molech, would be his argument. Uh, Page 8, halfway down. For a careful historian, as Wright is, it is surprising to me that he makes the logical mistake of thinking backwards when it comes to the question of gods and the reality of their existence. Since the gods of Greco-Roman antiquity do do not exist, he assumes, this must be true about the gods mentioned in the Old Testament. Much to the contrary. The original writers and readers of the Bible had no such trouble in believing that gods were very real and very dangerous. You shall not go after other gods, God said, the gods of the peoples who are all around you. For Yahweh, your God, is a jealous God 
lest the anger of Yahweh your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. I call it the dial tone question. If my wife thinks I'm having an affair and then she hears me talking to a dial tone, she's not mad. She's sad. And it's time to call men with white coats. And God is mad, not sad. And that tells us something about the reality of these beings, it seems to me. Page 9. The stories of Genesis 4 through 11. And all I want to say here is, I'm going to skip it for time, worship of other gods in Genesis 4 seems to turn into open interaction with the gods in Genesis 6. It seems to be the main point of Genesis 6, 1 to 4. We have open interaction going on here. And then, of course, leading to the assigned rule of these gods over the world in Genesis 10 and 11. And I would argue that these stories cannot be skipped or can't be just illustrative of something. They're taking you from 3 to 11, setting up 12 and the call of Abraham. So the bottom of the page, the stories of Genesis 12 and beyond. I agree with Wright and a majority of evangelicals that God's solution to the plight of the world began with the call of Abraham. God was setting out to do something with Abraham and more importantly to solve something. The question we are drawn to ask, of course, is what problem was God attempting to solve? Recall where the story of Abraham is placed, immediately after the worldwide flood and the subsequent apportion of lands and peoples to the authority of created gods. When Abraham was called to turn away from his worship of the God of his Babylonian family, Joshua 24 has got to be put right on top of Genesis 12, I would suggest that Abraham's call by God was the Creator's bold move to straighten out a man's loyalty away from other gods and toward himself. It had less to do with sin, Genesis 3, and more to do with loyalty, Genesis 4 through 11. That's my basic argument. Bottom of the page. To review so far, the stories that fill the Old Testament cannot be properly understood independently from the story of the created gods of the Bible. Humans certainly fall in the long run, fail to uh, fail in the long run to reflect God's image into the world. But there is a cause to this problem, and at no point is Adam blamed. It will also be too little to say that flesh is the problem, or even sin. The cause will be idolatry, and that kind of idolatry that most evangelicals have spent little to no time developing. The native desire found deep in the heart of man to give oneself to the worship of a spirit who is out to hurt the very individual who serves him. It is not enough to say that the problem of man lies at merely the heart level, though this is certainly where the problem shows its primary effect. The rescue operation of God in our world began and will, I believe, end with what he does to those spirits whom he has appointed over our world. The New Testament story, halfway down, um, how am I doing for time? I have until 10 after. Okay. Sounds good. Bottom of the page, second paragraph under New Testament. The names Joshua and Jesus are... No, I'm not going to read it. You can read that. How about the last paragraph? The, the gospel writers were familiar with Old Testament teaching about the power and authority of pagan deities, which is likely why the public ministry of Jesus begins with a confrontation of Satan. Evangelicals have taken the temptation account generally and made it a sanctification issue. Here's how you overcome temptation. All three Gospels put it at the front as though it's a commencement of something. It's not a sanctification story. It's an authority story, I believe, and that's why it's placed where it is. Uh, Twelve, you can skip. Again, I think it's good stuff, if I may say so, (laughs) but it's not necessary. Um, Thirteen, story of the gospel, second paragraph. I would recommend that the gospel message begins in the throne room scene of Psalm 82. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. The judgment handed down is not loving. How long will you judge unjustly? God asked the created spirits who have misused their power over the humans of the earth. The punishment upon these gods is stated at the end of the psalm. You shall perish. So there we have the opposite of God's love, his judgment, predicted to come upon spirit beings. Drop down to the fifth from last sentence. Those humans who love and worship created gods are wicked for doing so. And these will share in the destiny of the gods they worship. The ungodly will not stand in the judgment. Psalm 1.5 matches Paul's later warning that those who walk according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, will also feel the wrath of God to come. Everyone in the end shares the destiny of the god he or she worships. Um, 14. All I do on, well, two main things on 14, the second and third paragraph, is to make narrative sense out of two ideas that have intrigued us forever, and that one would be why are there no 
Dean, demonic exorcisms in the Old Testament, I would argue, watch the story. That's the whole point, is that they're happily doing their thing in Canaan. And then Jesus shows up and the lights come on and the cockroaches scatter. That's because the story is moving into an authoritative moment when the Son of God shows up. And now demons uh, scatter. Third paragraph is this uh, great text of 1 Timothy 1.16. 1 Timothy 3.16, one of the earliest creeds of the New Testament, which I argue is a story of Jesus being confronted by the gods of the Old Testament. Uh, 15, what is the summons of the gospel? My main question, I'm not going to read it. My main question is, why is faith the answer if sin was the problem? Because my answer is sin wasn't the problem. We made that up. It's medieval, and we just never cleaned that out of our evangelical reaction to the church. The issue is authority, and that's why what must I do to be saved, the question is answered by authority, believe on kurios. So what what to do with sin is handled within that story. But don't give the story more meaning than it was supposed to have because, again, I don't think it's the main story that the Bible's trying to tell. Last page, I'll read the conclusion. I hope I didn't skip too much, but I did want to leave time. Conclusion. The paradigm I'm suggesting in this paper views the events of Genesis 3 as signaling the beginning of human divine contact, which shows exponentially, grows exponentially through Genesis 11. Adam's sin spread idolatry into our world, but not guilt. Our race became subject to the service of spirits. Several times God says, I, I, I gave them up. And I take that four or five time mention of that to be indicative here. Our race became subject to the service of spirits who were our enemies. But Jesus, our Messiah, defeated Satan, ultimately death itself, and he is now in the position of Lord of the cosmos. The day will come when his rule will become public. I believe this second level story of scripture functioning within and under the first level incorporates all the other stories of the Bible. We will someday experience the healing of the nations, reversing the babble of Genesis 11, and in so doing the sin and sinful effects of Genesis 3. Thank you. I know the gen. Thank, and I'm not good at Second Temple literature in general. Uh, I own it; it's on the shelf, you know, kind of thing. But I know the Second Temple likes to make mention of Adam and Eve because you know where did sin start? And might as well go to the beginning. But it doesn't put blame today right. in why, the why exile. Is the why is the world the way it is? They never look at Adam. That's true. They do mention Adam, and that's uh, that's where a lot of us get our original sin doctrine. Is a there's no other place to put it we think, and B, there is mention of Adam and Eve in a lot of things, but watch carefully where Adam and Eve are used. It's never blaming for our present situation. It's always a curious story that happened, but you're right, I believe, well, and again, I'm not good at Second Temple stuff, but from what I'm seeing in it, it's um, seeing Genesis 6 is much greater of a problem than we give it time for. Let me ask, uh, you said sin is not the problem, authority is back to Genesis 3, could it be that it's not a either or, or both and it was not rebellion the lack to obey God's authority why does it have to be an either or question I was, good question, I was um, I gave this paper to um, my son's girlfriend and she's not that educated in the Bible she's just a lovely gal but not a Curiously, you know, she's not a scholar by any means. And she read the opening, it's page one, the, the quote at the bottom of the page. God created a kingdom, and he is the king, but he made human beings to represent him in that kingdom. Adam and Eve rejected this call. And, 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 and she looked right up and said, no, they didn't. They just ate an apple. Why is he saying they reje God, that they rejected God? And I, of course, I didn't tell her. I just said, but that's my paper. In other words... To me, it's not, it doesn't have to be either or as much as which one subsumes, which story subsumes the other story. So that when Jesus forgives someone, the question wasn't, 
how dare you? It's whose authority do you have to forgive? It's all sin. Well, the Catholic Church had this for years. The priest is the one that forgives. They understand as well that authority is the issue behind forgiveness. And I would argue, even though it's misplaced, I would say the Bible's model of how sin is forgiven will always start with who's in authority over whom. So C.S. Lewis brought this up. You trip me, I blame you. I forgive you. But if you trip someone else, I can't trip you, or I, I can't forgive you. Because that's not how forgiveness works. Forgiveness works by someone who's actually offended, and that's where authority comes into play. So I think, again, I'm arguing for sin being taken care of completely. My sin is totally gone because I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and upon him I put my trust. That takes care of my sin in the, I would argue, the biblical model. So it's there, but it's a third or fourth level story subsumed within the second level. You, um, you talk about the you talk about the gospel, and, and, uh, and you mentioned um, the idea of original sin. How and, and you said not a big problem. How your view? Like, I didn't say the sin's not a problem. Original sin. Right. right Just yeah, to be clear. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, okay. Good. How would you? How how would you present the gospel? Under, under, under this, because you said you said the Roman road, like you know, we, right. we go there. So, so what do you? I would do what Wright does, and here's why I think improving his story is the best way to go. Um, the story is the story. Notice that it's not a paradigm or a one, two, three, four. It's a story. Do you, do you have half an hour? Can I tell you a story? And the fact that we don't want to give half an hour, I think, precludes us from giving the gospel because we're not ready then to show what why the, our Bible is so thick. We've got something happening here that is worthy of the news that there's a new king. So and here's where right shines. That if you walk into an audience and say, the Vikings won the Super Bowl and we're in Atlanta, you're going to say, so what? But if I said that in a, in a place that loved the Vikings, like where I come from, there's meaning to it, there is context, there's history, there's four Super Bowls that we, I mean, we got all this going on so that now when I say to a waiting congregation, the Viking, I've got news, I've got euangelion, Jesus, the Vikings win, it erupts, or they're mad, they're Packer fans, just across the border, and you get this, uh, and that's why Paul said, I go into a town and Jews hate me and Greeks hate me too. He told them a story that neither side liked. That's a long answer to your question, but I just, it brings back a bad memory. I once preached a whole sermon series on the gospel, and it was basically you know, eight, ser eight sermons long. And at the end of it, one of my parishioners said, it would have been nice to hear the gospel though, through that. What he meant was, at the end of one of those sermons, give us the four points. Tell me what to do. And I I hugged him, you know, and said, <laughs> I'm sorry you missed it, but uh, he, was, he, was, uh, he was very offended once when I said, if you want to know how to be a Christian, come back next week. God bless you. I did that purposely because to me that's part of what Jesus would have done. Follow me. I'll see you tomorrow. Because if you're intent about this, we're not done yet. And if you think you're done, you're missing my story. So again, when I say this to a non you know a non right audience, uh, they're not happy. And this is why right has caused such grief because he's giving a different story and it's it's different like mine is different I suspect but um, I'll leave it there what is the meaning of the crucifixion in this, in this story I would go with right here again crucifixion and atonement are two different things to him and to me and so in my story crucifixion is the unexpected twist of plot that except unless you're well versed in Maccabees and again we, we don't do this but the idea of someone dying for the nation Caiaphas caught it that we will somehow be given hope as a people because of one and that idea would be the crucifixion idea that I would see uh, as a theological spin at that moment which again the disciples wouldn't have caught this at the time but looking back they can see a dying Messiah okay now Isaiah 53 makes sense and they put it together 
but that would be my theology of a crucifixion as opposed to atonement. Again, we keep those separate, at least in my head. Uh, I think the Bible does too. I guess my follow-up question is then what, what but I'm not sure how this relates here exactly, but when Paul says that we are crucified with Christ, that's how participation, that, right. So the very last page, This, if you were with us five years ago at ETS when Wright, Schreiner, and Thielman, anybody here for that? Classic moment on the very back page. The moderator started the question and answer period with the very bottom page, 16. May each panelist describe how one becomes a Christian. By the way, that was my question. I'm so proud. Um, <laughs> Thielman and Schreiner gave what you could expect to be the evangelical answer. Wright gave an answer which to your question is, I participate with Jesus in everything he did. I suffer, I die, I rise, I reign. I'm part, I'm maybe the fifth act in a four-part play, but I am following through on everything that happened to my Savior, and I'm fitting in. So what was your question again? How do I participate? I die with Christ. The same way I'm, yeah, I would take it the same way I'm raised, same way I suffer. He is my proxy, not my substitute, and he does things that I could put my feet where he was. And so as I, Hebrews is a two or five, he is my pioneer. I live my life with Jesus on every step, including crucifixion, which is obviously a, a, a bit illustrative, but. It would be, I think, I hope, identical. To say Jesus is Lord when I have a coin in my pocket that says Augustus is Lord, I've got to make a choice. Is it him or is it a Nazarene that died and resurrected? So, yes, I think I'm answering your question as you posted. It. It's very tight with, with right on that one, that uh, the proclamation of the gospel is the news of his ascension and thus lordship, which to a Gentile audience or a Jewish is going to be offensive. How would you preach Jesus from the Leviticus 16 passage on Yom Kippur? He is a, well, it's John 1, here's my quick spin, um, is when John saw Jesus, there's the lamb, could have said, he could have said goat, I suppose, there goes the lamb that takes away the expiation right, the sin of not just the Jew, but the Gentile, the world. Cosmos to John seems to have a big picture. So I think John prophetically, or he just knew what's going on here, that here comes the one who will take away, and again, that's part of the authority issue within Torah. God gave them this storyline to send a goat out to take their sins with them so that when the little boy goes home and asks, Mom, what did we do today? We can talk about the gracious love of God for our people, thus authority, and I can give my garbage to that God out in the desert, Azazel, and he can have my garbage. That's the authority, again, uh, to me, that's, that's in play here. And it's, notice the, the spin on that would be sin is taken care of, but it's under a second-level story that has to do with, am I a faithful Israelite, first of all? It's not a magical thing. I'm following through on my God's storyline, even if it's symbolic or however you take that. I'm enjoying the story that God gives me physically to play out, even if it's my sin on the back of a goat. And Jesus is that for me. I was told by John that Jesus is my goat. My goat, not the other guy, but mine. I'm, I'm part of the crew that has believed that Jesus is Lord. So I get to have him as my goat. If you don't want Jesus as your Lord, he's not your goat. I think that's how they would use that story. He wasn't the goat for the Moabite. He was the goat for the Jew. And so that's Leviticus 16. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you.